Welcome back to the Industry 4.0 and Sustainable Supply Chain stage here at COGX. I hope that you enjoyed the last session as much as I did. I am Katz Keeley. I am the CEO of Beep and the founder of Frontline.Live. And I'm your MC for this stage for the next couple of days. In a second, I'll hand you over to Fred Lardieg, who will lead the next conversation. And the panel will be talking about how can startups help corporates to survive and thrive during the con coronavirus pandemic? So a massive pleasure to hand you over to Fred Lardieg, partner at Muba Dalla Ventures. Good afternoon uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Fred Lardieg. Uh, I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Uh, I'm a partner with Mubadala Ventures, a global venture capital platform with a presence in San Francisco, Abu Dhabi, and London. Mubadala is a global investment company backed by the government of Abu Dhabi, with investments in over 50 different countries. I'm responsible for our European Ventures Fund, a 400 million growth fund focused on Series B and above. We've backed companies such as Globo, the food delivery company, and Waymo, uh, the autonomous driving company incubated by Alphabet. Right now at Mubadala Ventures, we are very excited about the future of the industry. We are currently looking for startups that can accelerate the digitization of the industrial world. With the advent of cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things, we believe that the way we produce and transport things will radically change over the next 10 years. So this leads us to today's panel, which is about how startup can accelerate the industry 4.0 transformation, especially in a post-coronavirus world. I'm delighted to have the perfect panel to debate this topic with me today since we have two startup CEOs and two investors who represent some large industrial groups. So I'm going to ask my panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, first, uh, we have Malin. Hi, and hi, Fred. Uh, my name is Malin Karlström. I'm uh, based in Stockholm, and uh, I work as a senior vice president for ABB Technology Ventures, looking at investments throughout Europe uh, into companies that uh, have strategic value to what ABB is today and what ABB is tomorrow. So we're looking at smart factories, smart automation, smart buildings, smart cities. Uh, and we invest from everything in everything from seed stage up to series B and C. Very good. Uh, then we have Theo. Hello, everyone. I'm Theo Saville, co-founder and CEO of CloudNC. And what we do is build fully autonomous factories for the production of precision components, like this one, which goes on a fuel cell. So today, if I want to get this made, then I'll have to send it to a factory where a lot of very expert people will spend hours to weeks telling machines how to produce a part like this. We've developed software which can completely automate everything that happens in one of these factories end to end and are now building these flexible autonomous factories that contain no human decision making. Great, thank you very much. Then we have Daniel. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. I'm Daniel Kirchleitner, the partner responsible for Europe from Next47, which is the Siemens powered uh, venture capital uh, firm. Um, so um, we invest in everything which uh, is uh, relevant either to Siemens or Siemens customers and uh, solving solving pain point there. And automation is uh, certainly one of the areas in robotics um, where we pay a lot of uh, attention to. And we think with uh, the current um, happenings we see in the market and around COVID, um, it will get even more relevant. Thank you. And then finally, we have Christian. So hi, I'm Christian. I'm CEO and co-founder of a German startup called Wandelbots. And basically, we have a technology that enables everyone, regardless of their technical background, cultural background, or education, to program industrial robots and manufacturing processes. So 
Um, today, pro um, programming robots, getting them to work, um, basically is a job done by experts and mainly done by, by manual programming. Um, and even worse, every robot manufacturer provides its own proprietary technology to stack on programming languages. So what we have is a technology where you basically can show a robot a task by example, and the software is learning how the task works and is able to generate um, a solution which makes the robot solve that task fully autonomously, uh, tremendously speeding up um, the development efforts for a new application in robotics and, and uh, finally getting them up to a type of flexibility which is meet, needed in, the, in, in today's manufacturing world. So, um... I wanted to start uh, the panel by, you know, addressing the topic of coronavirus because that's what everybody is talking about right now. And if you read the news headlines, you know, it feels like the manufacturing sector has been very, very severely impacted by by the coronavirus. Um, I was interested to hear Siemens' view on this. Right, so Siemens is a very large organization that operates more than three hundred factories globally. Um, so, Dan, what's your view on this? What's the impact, the actual impact of the coronavirus on manufacturing? I think it's a it's a good question. We have to consider uh, different uh, different dimensions. Uh, I think one is we should always keep in mind what is uh, what is the impact for for the employees. Um, uh, and uh, I think uh, a certain uh, dimension is uh, certainly what does it mean for the factories and for the customers and maybe the uh, the third one is what does it mean for for young companies like we have in the in the panel discussion today i think yeah. um in in general for some sectors uh, for some industries it has really been a dramatic impact with factory shutdowns um and uh, for others not uh, because uh, if you produce uh, critical parts um you will you will always uh, use them it doesn't matter uh, what is going on in the world and uh, that is what we have very much seen with uh, with siemens factories for example um, so I think um, from from this perspective, um, if you if you think about Germany, there haven't been uh, massive massive layoffs because um, maybe not all sectors have been impacted, and everybody knows that the production volume will uh, will get back. What we have seen from a uh, from a from a venture perspective is that um, it is a good chance for for young companies um, to to sell their solutions now to approach potential customers now. Uh, because um, some factory managers have had a bit more time than usual uh, to think about the next step of modernization and uh, innovation. Um, so therefore, I would say there are some, some negative impacts, but if you believe that there is a future after this phase, uh, then I think it's the right time to invest, uh, build new products, build new technology, um, and uh, work with reliable customers. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, give us an idea of, you know, out of the, you know, hundreds of, factories that Siemens has globally, how many have had total shutdowns, just to give a, sen a sense of that? Yeah, I think um, there wasn't really a, really a shutdown, rather an uh, adjustment in terms of the, the production volume. Um, I think what we read in the news, for example, shutdown of factories, it's mainly happening in sectors like like automotive. Um, but if you, if you talk to uh, uh, the usual automotive uh, players, for example, again, here in, in Germany, um, they might have a shutdown of a couple of weeks um, uh, because um, consumers are rather rather reluctant to, to buy cars. Um, but um, even in this sector, as I said before, they have used the time uh, for sure to, to modernize the factories. Uh, and it was, uh, was a good break uh, to push forward some projects they had on the radar anyway. Um, and uh, this, uh, these are projects not only with uh, established players, also with, uh, with a lot of young companies, what we have seen. Mm -hmm. And, and Theo, what's your view on that on this short-term impact of, of coronavirus, right? Daniel is saying it's actually not that severe. What's what's your view on this? I think it depends very much on wh where in the supply chain we're talking about. So the most visible part of manufacturing is the, the mega OEMs, the BAE systems, the Volkswagens, the Fiats, and so on. And uh, you know what we have to remember is that for each of these companies, they don't make everything themselves. You know, A car actually contains 3,000 sub-assemblies, and those all come from different factories across Europe further and further down the supply chain. So what we um, noticed 
noticed because we sit quite far down the supply chain, we make single metal components, was that the larger players either shut down their factories temporarily and froze production and stopped ordering, or they started running down their inventory and they also stopped ordering. So across the CNC machining subcontract tract industry, everything stopped for almost two months and then it started returning again. And the problem that this industry now faces, which I think the lower tiers of manufacturing always faces in a major economic shock, is the large companies that make up the customer base. You know, they're well geared to survive a crisis like this, whereas the suppliers, the tiny little workshops with 10 to 20 employees, of whom most of them are, they do not have cash and they're very highly geared with debt and they are tend to be decimated during regular recessions. But this wasn't a regular recession. This was a complete ceasing of cash flow for several months. And so we've seen a number of our suppliers go out of business. We've seen a lot of talk shift from the survival of these large companies to now protecting their supply chains and protecting their strategic partners, which is quite interesting. So I'd expect to see a consolidation of this industry that uh, persists for some time. Okay. And so moving the focus towards the, you know, so, so we've talked about the short term impact of coronavirus, and it's different, at different uh, depending on what level you look at. If we look forward to the midterm or the long term impact of coronavirus, what do you think is going to change in manufacturing or, or in this in supply chain management? I, th I believe that this situation, I mean, one could one could call it a black swan, but it really is not because uh, the uh, the probability of this happening uh, has has been there and will be be there again. Uh, but then the effects of the coronavirus that might be considered perhaps a, a black swan or a perfect storm or whatever you want. But I think that this impact is just highlights and, and, and heightens the already existing macro trends. So what, what do we, we invest in? What do we believe in, in, uh, in going forward? It's the electrification, the automation, uh, and the robotization of if we talk about production, for instance. And I see that solving for distance, uh, which is one critical factor in this situation, just and heightens the need for such solutions, right? Right, like uh, Cloud and C and the Vandalbots, uh, which are good examples of startups that address that issue. Like, for instance, if you take uh, discrete and electronics manufacturing, you have uh, since uh, line space is at a premium, you, you have these assembly workers sitting side by side uh, 0.6 meters apart. And now you have this requirement of two meters apart, right? Uh, to, to hinder uh, further disease. Uh, and how do you solve that? Now robotics might be one solution to that. So I believe that we will see these uh, macro trends just being exponentially larger as we move forward. Uh, and so the stronger we, the strong will become stronger and the weak will become weaker. And that we, we see also when it comes to, for instance, the attractiveness to uh, too many of these startups searching for venture capital. Uh, the already strong uh, companies with some momentum of some sort doesn't have to uh, lower valuations or terms. Uh, and then it's harder for more risk prone businesses to attract uh, external capital in these times. Yeah, so so generally speaking, my point of view with respect to to the challenges now in in times of of COVID is, um, so after the COVID lockdown, basically our organic inbound for us as a company uh, exploded, um, so went up more than five hundred percent, and there are two major things coming together, and I think this was mentioned already, is that automation in those times is is um, something. Just whilst we lost Christian, I'll uh, I'll give my answer. Um, so one of the things that we have were already witnessing was reshoring. So from about 2014, the number of manufacturing jobs in say the US stopped going down and started going back up again. And in 2018 to 2019, that accelerated even more sharply. But this reshoring is to you know the Western manufacturing economies is usually only possible when it's driven by automation to bring costs in line with what we see in the Far East. Now. 
what this has highlighted is the weakness of complex international supply chains. And everyone is talking about reshoring. Many of our customers are actually in the process of reshoring work from the Far East to the UK or Europe. And uh, that is going to drive increased demand for automation, you know, as Christian was referring to, because the only way to support that reshoring is indeed to build automated solutions that are more cost effective than human solutions. Let's try to see if we have a um, question back on. It doesn't look like we have. Uh, Daniel, what's your view on this? Yeah, it's, I think um, I'm, I'm always wondering what we are currently seeing. Is it really um, a, a significant change or is it rather an acceleration of what we have already seen before um, this crisis? Um, and I think a big portion of it is, is rather an acceleration of what we have seen before the crisis. Um, so what have we seen before the crisis? I think there are some 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 building blocks in terms of technology, um, which um, which uh, haven't really existed beforehand, um, enabling automation and robotization. So if we think about unlimited computing power in the uh, in the factories, more or less allowing the separation of hardware and software, and therefore uh, much faster um, and shorter innovation cycles. So, um, but I think the crisis has shown that um, uh, that companies need to invest in these uh, products and the technologies behind it, um, because you wanna you wanna make sure that you have a reliable supply chain, and more you don't need to you don't want to rely anymore on this very distributed global supply chain. Rather, wanna do some uh, some more production where your customer sits, including including Europe. Um, so that is what uh, what we are seeing, and uh, and therefore that's all the reason why I said at the beginning I think it's a it's a really good opportunity for young companies um, because it makes it makes people think um, what what to do in order to solve some of the issues which have made existed already before the crisis, but which have become much more much more prominent uh, and much more impactful. Okay. And so back to Christian. Christian, we we lost uh, we lost you halfway yes. through. So so yeah, there, there was an issue with the with the connection. But um, I, I think what I've what I've still heard is that, that the, the the issue of, or not issue, but the phenomenon on, on reshoring was already discussed. So this is basically basically what happened is that that. Um, Especially the large um, OEMs and also tier one um, suppliers, basically they, they have tried to get the supply chain back from especially Asian countries back to Europe, which led to a tremendous increase in demand for, for plastics, metal industry. Um, however, they had to be very quickly adapt their production to, to uh, changing demands. And then um, in order to do so and combine this with automation, of course, flexible automation technologies are needed. And then the, the big trend of trying to, to automate more in a sense that you get less dependent on, on, on people in the shop floor um, is the second trend we're currently seeing. And this is driving digitization of, of shop floors tremendously because you can only manage automated devices in a, in a flexible and scalable way if you have a proper degree of, um, of digitization. And I think there is still a lot, a lot, a lot of work to do in that sector in order to, to speak really of digitized shop floors. Mm -hmm. So everybody seems to agree on the fact that, you know, we are moving into a world where there's going to be more automation, more digitization in, in, in factories. Uh, pushing this to the extreme, do you think we are getting anywhere soon to a you know world where the, the factories are entirely? I think the question was going to be yep. completely lights out factories. Um, so uh, just to give my answer on that, yeah. I think that lights out factories are highly overrated as a concept. If we take uh, Amazon logistics and warehousing as an example, the disruption didn't come from these warehouses becoming lights out. The disruption came when they became fully automated and flexible and scalable. So when we moved from human decision-making and paper-based processes to 
uh, effectively the use of human robots because a human utilized at 95 to 100 percent effectiveness is very nearly as effective as a robot in these cases so that is where the 90 percent of the gain is made and then you can take it further but when you introduce robotics you often lose flexibility so the real barrier that we've been facing as an industry to fully lights out factories is today it is possible to automate machinery to do the same thing over and over again but as soon as you want to change what a machine is doing you need people to get involved to tell the machines how to reconfigure and you can't have a lights out factory unless you are willing to be completely inflexible in what you are making and that does work when you're making millions of the same robot arm, for example, um, but it does not work for the 90% of manufacturing, which is high mix, low to medium volume. And that is the trend which we are moving towards, right? So, I mean, the volumes that you are speaking about there is just increasing. Hmm. Uh, and more so now when we're also talking about uh, near shoring, of course. Uh, and it's like, I believe when we talk about robotics, it's more about moving people than removing people. Uh, and the robots can take dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs from us. So we don't have to do it anymore. And it's the same like with the artificial intelligence, that it, it augments people. It doesn't really replace managers, but it helps managers to, to make better decisions. So I also see that maybe in one smaller segment uh, of manufacturing, that might be that light out factories is, is the most optimal solution but in the majority no yes um, and and i can confirm that there is a long way to go there of course there are very special industries especially th those are th that are highly standardized for example like semiconductors so there are of course factories in, in semiconductors that have a hundred percent degree of, of automation, especially in the 200 millimeter front lock, um, front end production. But um, but this is not true for for the vast majority of all the other industries. So you should always keep in mind that in a in a in a today's car manuf um, production, for example, ninety percent of the final assembly is done manually. And, and consequently, uh, there is a long way to go. And, and what one should always consider is that those kinds of um, manufacturing flexibility we are talking about always involve some mechanical parts. So it's not simply that you can can adjust the, the software part and then magically you can you can adjust your production to new types of work pieces. So it always involves mechanical work. So getting completely rid of people uh, is, um, is is not possible anytime soon. But what we will see is that um, more machines and and uh, and the overall production processes um, will be handled on. Uh, with digital methods and thus uh, can be managed also remotely and so we will see an increase in the in the automation and flexibility of automation but completely lights out factories for for the standard industries will ta will take a very long time maybe we can talk about dusk factories <laughs> a new concept yeah <laughs> Okay, um, and so now let's talk about the role of startups, right, in all of this. Um, I'm interested to hear from ABB and Siemens, you know, how can uh, startups, you know, work with very large groups like yourself? And, and do you think that, you know, COVID is actually gonna, going to accelerate the cooperation with the big groups? Malin, do you wanna go first? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if, if you take off from what we've just said, the need for uh, and the speed with, with which technology and solutions uh, are moving forward, it's just accelerating. Nothing will ever be as slow as it is today, again. Uh, for me, I view startups and collaborations as a way of de-risking. So, I, I believe we, we put more than $1 billion per year into R&D. But then it's 100% ABB money, right? And if we go into a syndicate and, and into a, a venture uh, through investments, uh, it's only a part of ABB money that is put into that company. So for me, venture capital is also a way of de-risking uh, our own technological advancements. Um, when it comes to how the, the, the bigger incumbents talk to and collaborate with startups, I still feel that the momentum is there. 
Uh, ABB has, uh, in addition to this venture arm, also a collaboration unit called Synerleap. And we onboard companies, everything from seed stage up to actually publicly listed companies that want to collaborate with ABB. And the, uh, and the frequency on which we on onboard and when we start collaborations is continuing in, in an undisturbed manner. Uh, so the, the need from the organization and, and, and the push to, to move things forward is still there. But also since in these strange times, cash is king. Uh, so the need for a distinct ROI and perhaps a bit more solid solutions uh, are perhaps a bit heightened from the incumbent side. Uh, so it's easier for a bit more mature companies to, to come in and, and make projects uh, with ABB. So this is strange situation where the need but then again, the risk awareness, uh, they fight each other because the need is more apparent, but the cash is more, is more dear. Um, so one has to handle those types of, uh, those two uh, demands from, 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 the, from the mothership in order to make things work. Um, and for our startups in our portfolio, it's actually, they have not seen so much impact uh, from their um, on their demand side, actually, which is very nice, and and all of them work with with the bigger and larger corporations, so that's a it's a good sign. Yeah, that's so, good to hear. Daniel, yeah. what's your view on this? Yeah, I think maybe at first a, a channel view, and then a more more specific view to um, uh, to corporates and incumbents uh, in particular. I think the the general view I have is that if we believe for a second uh, in this uh, digitalization trend uh, christian christian also mentioned um, we can assume that the adoption of uh, of technology and innovation will happen or is happening much faster and i think that is what we can see in factories because if you have if you have a more digital environment it's uh, it's much easier uh, to deploy new solutions new innovations and um, I think that's 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 certainly true, uh, and that's that's very positive for every young company um, working in the environment of uh, of factories or or uh, producing industries in general. The the second uh, view I have is um, more coming from a uh, from a venture perspective. Um, I think incumbents it's uh, it's always related to a certain uh, sales cycle which is rather slow because you have a complex set of uh, stakeholders, um, complex decision making, and uh, uh, the crisis won't change it. Maybe it's uh, getting even a bit more complicated because there are budget cuts and so on. So therefore, I would, I would uh, recommend, as I always do, don't only rely on your, uh, on your enterprise sales. Um, uh, keep all the, the mid-sized companies and small-sized companies in mind. Uh, which which uh, are customer groups for you as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a good uh, good piece of advice. Um, and another one, you know, another question that is you know somewhat related to this, um, especially in the industry 4.0, you know, space. Uh, a lot of startups have you know experienced the POC death, right? So. Uh, as in, you know, they've managed to sell a POC to a large corporate, but then after the POC, nothing happened. What, what kind of what advice would you have for you know for startups to make sure that something happens after the POC? POC being a proof of concept, just to be very clear. Yeah, so you know, the, the startup deploys things on a very small scale, but then it fails mm. to get to a bigger scale within the the the, the, the corporate. Mm. Like, like for us, if we speak about Cinelib, for instance, uh, I mean, the entire uh, reason for being for Cinelib is creating collaboration projects. Uh, and we have noticed that once you have reached one project within ABB, usually a POC, uh, that on average takes six months, then the second POC takes six weeks. Uh, so it, it goes to show that if you have some positive uh results to show it's easier to get things going again in, in in some other part of the organization and we say that to these companies that we give you a hunting license but it's up to you to go and hunt within abb we can point you in the right direction mm -hmm. but you must also make sure that the momentum and the energy is there right so we're not going to put stuff in your lap uh and with the POC, you must also find within the organization the right ambassadors. 
and you must understand how the organization is built and who is really de the decision maker. Um, because you, you need the right people to, to sponsor uh, further engagement from within, uh, within the, the, the incumbent. Uh, and one of the, I mean, if you look at predictive maintenance, which is a huge uh, macro trend, right, in the field of industrial AI, the, the first and foremost reason uh, for implementing such solutions is the cost reduction. So knowing the, the hurt of, of, the, <laughs> of the mothership, then you know what to address and then you can show uh, the results, right? So it does matter uh, to, to the large corporation. So it's, it's, uh, it boils down to really being a true entrepreneur and knowing which right uh, contacts uh, to have, right? Mm -hmm. So, so maybe, maybe I, can, I can also share some, some learnings on our end here because we, we successfully managed to, to step out of this, what you called um, POC, POC dev or POC hell basically is uh, first learning we had is like, um, um, in large corporates, it's very hard to to have a successfully scaling POC when when it when the introduction in the corporate is top down, and it's even more of a problem if it's bottom up. So having having a bottom up first and top down second, and then a meet them in the middle. So you you basically attract first really the users, the shop floor people, and then uh, go go via C level helps a lot. And and second of all is we switch from POC to um, POV, which which stands for proof of value. And um, basically what we have changed is that um, with a customer prior to stepping into any project, uh, we first uh, define real measurable benchmarks. So we ask the customers what is actually in for you. And then we paid good attention that it's neither from an innovation budget, nor is it some, some fancy like innovation room um, um, toy example. We, we were really, putting focus on that it's really production work. And then if you have a benchmark, if you have uh, if you have a real production uh, project, and then uh, second of all, what you also do prior to the project is define the next steps. What happens if the, P if the project meets basically those benchmarks? So the customer must do a commitment in case you, you, you do a successful project, what are the next steps? And this brings in um, the, this kind of seriousness and, and commitment from the customer side to really be not let it be some project which is over at some point in time, but really to have it as a first step inside a long cooperation. Yeah, very good points. Uh, Daniel, what's the what's the secret to avoid the POC hell at the Siemens? Yeah, I, I very much agree with um, uh, with with Christian's view. I think which is um, um, applicable uh, to, to every major. Uh, or larger corporate. Um, I think first of all, I mean, really select um, uh, the, like, the potential customers you want to work with at the beginning, um, having your long-term vision in mind. Um, and um, does it is it is it really necessary to work with a very large uh, company at the beginning, or is it maybe better to work with a more agile, mid-sized company at the beginning uh, to build your product? I think the the second point is after you have uh, gotten the election right and can be with a, with a big a big corporate as well, um, uh, figure out uh, who is the person who really has the problem and who has the money to pay for it. Um, and uh, as Christian said, um, it's maybe not uh, the right approach to go top down right, right away or uh, go bottom up um, or go through the innovation department um, if, uh, if there is a person in the company uh, who really has the problem, the decision power and the money uh, to pay for, for solving um, his or her problem. And um, I think the the, sec the third point uh, I want to share is um, you have to you have to charge for your offering right at the beginning because only if you charge for it you will figure out if this is something um, a potential customer really needs or if this is only something to to please an innovation roadmap or an innovation uh, project and after six months so after the, the first uh, PUC phase it's uh, it's over. Mm -hmm. Theo, any view on the POC? Any any learnings from the POC stage of life 
for yeah so we have a somewhat different view from our experience so when we started uh, our intention was originally to become a software as a service company and sell factories software that they could use to automate their equipment but what we very quickly realized is within the lower tiers of the supply chain these um, customers are so incredibly fragmented that there's too much variability to support everybody and none of them have any money so the market size was 500 million but the market that they serve is 300 billion and so we decided instead of serving automation software to these tiny factories let's just sidestep that entire industry build our own factories and serve their market which is you know hundreds of times larger much easier to access has a near instant sales cycle requires no proof of concept phase you know the way you get in with the customers you sell them a component one week then you sell them 10 then 10,000 the next year and then you really start growing within their wallet share so we we looked at the we looked at the industry, we looked at it from a software as a service perspective and said, you know what, this is going to be too difficult. And the interesting thing is, I think that that set of problems persists across much of manufacturing. Uh, in our view, one of the reasons why so much of manufacturing is so technologically backwards is because it is so fragmented and there is so little money to spend on software. The fragmentation makes it very difficult to build software that can support all of the customers. It also means that they're not willing to pay very much money, which means the markets are unattractive to build really advanced automation software for, which means that nobody builds automation software for these businesses, which means they stay non-scalable, which means that the market stays non-attractive. So you know, our view is that there's a systemic problem there, and that's the reason why you know, we frequently hear the conversation of proof of concept hell for uh, manufacturing technology startups. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much all for, for sharing that. So we have about eight or so minutes left. Um, you know, given that you all spend you know, all your days and nights in this industry 4.0 sector, I would love to hear uh, from each of you which innovation or which startup you, know, you get really excited about at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to start with Christian on this. Yes, of course. Um, in, so, so me speaking for, for especially automation and robotics, um, there are many, many, many different technologies that will now ent enter the space. So basically the entire industry, all the even even companies like ABB, sorry for saying so, is relying on technology that directly comes from the 80s. So what we are currently seeing is that um, like more, I would e even say modern, not bleeding edge technologies entering the space, right? Um, so the technologies I'm most excited about for me as a CEO of Wonderbots is um, uh, basically re re pretty much related to edge cloud uh, deployments and, and also related to 5G. What, so what we are currently seeing is uh, large, co large corporates like Volkswagen or BMW um, shifting towards cloud-based deployments from, from a software point of view, um, either going with, with Microsoft or, or Amazon, basically, as, as, the, as the platforms. But then there are uh, companies like Nokia uh, that come into play and uh, basically providing the network infrastructure to have those, uh, basically, deployments on the edge. Uh, which gives us as, as software companies in the manufacturing space, finally, the, basically, they paved the way in order to have SaaS-based businesses and, 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 and basically modern deployment technologies in the shop floor. So that's number one. And then, of course, um, technology is coming from the sector of artificial, artificial intelligence and also interactivity in terms of um, augmented reality, mixed reality. Um, Give the give give us the possibility to um, basically de deploy very modern and easy to use technology. So what's the mega trend in the entire industry is is ease of use. That's no surprise because especially nowadays um, dealing with robots and dealing with the technology, handling the complexity, is is one of the of the toughest problems. And uh, there are very few so solutions out there in the market. And um, so what we are working on is really um, um, driving ease of use in terms of robots to an extreme and, and, and fostering on human robot collaboration. And um, especially um, artificial intelligence 
and and giving robots more uh, capabilities of sensing their environment and and generating solutions to problems autonomously but also giving giving people feedback and letting them guide robots um, through new tasks uh, basically will drive um, the mass adoption of robots especially in the small and medium-sized sector okay great uh who wants to go next uh malin do you want to go next Of course, plentiful uh, uh, interesting startups out there. Of course, we have a number of them in our own portfolio. Uh, I'm a big Yumi fan. That's the collaborative robot of EBB. And we have this company called MCheck, which is really trying to put the Yumi into a context, contest, context. Uh, and they're working through both software and hardware, which really uh, I mean, it's deep tech at its core, right? Um, so I, I think that uh, such solutions that brings the Yumi from coming into a box, being as, as Christian said, hard to program into a context where it really uh, shows the benefits. Uh, that's really, I mean, that's, I think we, we can really move the needle uh, if we succeed in doing that. Another interesting one, I mean, we're talking a lot about artificial intelligence and it's cloud and, and fog and, and uh, edge uh, applications, but also such more, uh, how you say, hardware related stuff, such as materials companies. And we have this graphene company in our portfolio, graphene, which is a, the holy grail of material, 200 times stronger than steel. Um, so if we solve that riddle with the, with the, uh, industrializing graphene applications without its agglomerating, we are, we are looking also to a complete uh, disruption uh, of, of the industry. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, everything that is related to robotics and safety, which is uh, a core of ABB as well. Inspect is an interesting Italian company that works with uh, sensor technology. Uh, in order to make uh, collaborations between humans and robots when you have larger robotics arms uh, possible. So you don't have to have the, the poor robots uh, locked in big cages. Um, so, I mean, there are a number, just a massive uh, ecosystem of interesting startups. It's hard to just pick one. Great, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Theo? Sure, so the the kinds of startups that I'm most excited about, uh, and it invariably does seem to be startups delivering this kind of technology, is anybody working on what we call target-based manufacturing rather than expertise-based manufacturing. So that's the move from, I have something I want to make, I give it to people using better software in order to make that easier, which is you know regular manufacturing, to I have a target, software is going to decide how that is going to be produced. And the really interesting thing about that is that kind of software can be combined with the next generation of engineering software being generative design to create much stronger, you know, create effectively full automation of the design and manufacturing process where the design process and the manufacturing process are combined together to create optimal objects. Uh, we're not seeing very many of these startups yet. It's usually one or two per industry vertical. So I'm very excited about uh, tempo automation in the PCB space. I'm very excited about bright machines and uh, I think I need to look into mtech as well in the robotic mm -hmm. assembly space we are working on this for precision manufacturing uh, so mm -hmm. you know we see a future where manufacturing is not fragmented but dominated by scaled autonomous manufacturers and I think those are the companies which could come to dominate their spaces okay interesting and uh, last but not least Daniel yeah I keep, I keep it short I mean there are a lot of areas I could talk about but um, I mean, we look at the moment a lot for companies flexibilizing uh, robotics uh, because I think that's one of the key issues uh, in the industry. So if you think about the, the installed base of robots, I think they could be much better used if you find a way to to faster, simply uh, apply them to to new problems. So maybe programming is, uh, is one of the, the key issues there. Uh, and I think uh, a second thing is um, to flexibilize robots um, is to, uh, to to add new skills uh, which could be uh, about computer visioning which could be uh, about uh, 
uh, sensing. Um, so these are, these are this is some or one of the, the key point points we are going after at the moment and um, uh, looking at companies solving this pain point. Very good. And if I can just add, because you know us as Mobile Ventures, we are spending time in the in the industry 4.0 sector as well. Uh, we are looking at a number of companies that are uh, doing um, the things that people have mentioned today. I think the only additional thing I would mention is you know people who create digital twins of you know factories and then have got all the live data of of the factory in a single location, whether it's you know on premise or in the cloud. And then you you know we're excited by the potential applications that you can do on top of that. You know what kind of uh, applications can you do by applying machine learning on on top of this data, right? So that's the kind of things that we are uh, currently looking at. Um, fantastic. Uh, we are coming to the end of our uh, panel session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Malin, Daniel, Christian, and Theo for uh, contributing to this panel. Uh, you've shared some great insights from us uh, from the increase of reshoring that will drive more automation, that will drive more flexible automation. Uh, you've also highlighted the fact that you know it's a good opportunity for startups to engage with large groups. Um, and you've shared some tips on how to avoid the POC hell. Uh, I really liked uh, Christian's uh, uh, focus on POV, the proof of value. You know, if, uh, you know, demonstrate that you can generate value for for your customer. Um, so thank you very much for sharing these valuable in, in, insights. Uh, we're gonna wrap this up uh, now, and th thank you very much uh, for the virtual audience. Thank you so much. What a fantastic conversation. There's been some really, really useful insights. I built the very first ever um, open innovation platform back in 2004 to connect large organizations to startups. And I've been helping large corporations to embed what we call the future uh, ways of working, future wow, for a very long time. And Mike, to add to what um, they said, and also to kind of reiterate what they said, corporates are extremely complex. It's very, very easy to get pushed out by the corporate antibodies. So you really need to make sure that you understand where the pain points are. You need to make sure that their success and your success are absolutely aligned or it'll never work. And make sure that you've got permission and passion from the very top and that you create design with the people that I call change agents. But there are so many opportunities now if you get it right. So with that, I'm gonna hand you over to the Q&A. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.